Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tamil Innovators by TamilCulture.com. I'm your host, Arani Raskumar. It brings me great pleasure to introduce our guest today on such a special day, International Women's Day. Our guest today is Kasturi Chalaraja Wilson. Welcome, Kasturi. Hi, and uh, pleasure being with all of you all uh, today. It's our pleasure. I think uh, we got a lot of questions in our form on so many questions that, you know, before I jump into, I just wanted to briefly give a one-liner of an introduction about you, but then I think you can speak more about yourself than me. So, you know, for everyone who doesn't know, um, Kasturi is the first female group CEO of a publicly traded company in Sri Lanka, which is amazing. Um, and that being said, Kasturi, you're so much more than that. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our, our viewers? <laughs> okay, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, that's a tagline I inherited about two and a half, three years ago. But predominantly, um, I'm a passionate woman who um, is firstly a mom. I defined myself as a mom for the longest of time till my kids kind of, I became um, redundant of not used to the kids. So they're big and grown up. Um, I'm from Sri Lanka and um, I think my motto has been, um, ex I mean, whatever you embark in, I love to do it with my honey, with my whole heart and soul and passionately, which can be detrimental in some instances. Um, grew up in a small middle-class family, uh, sister and me, and um, I had the dubious honor of being a tomboy because we didn't have a brother. So, so I guess that in some ways I grew up with um, the freedom of doing things which normally a girl is not, is told you, sh you shouldn't be this, do this, you should behave this way, you should talk this way. I was not given any of those rules. So that's who I am. Um, I'm passionate about um, human beings and uh, and seeing seeing that there's equality in the world or there's the elimination of inequality um career is a is kind of a by the way thing which happened to me and um given the fact that i i whatever i do i want to do it well i was i'm very competitive don't get me wrong i'm very competitive i'm not amb ambitious in terms of title but i'm very competitive in succeeding and and i think it gives me a platform to do things for them passionate about so that's who I am uh, I live in Sri Lanka with my mom I'm at the moment talking to you from Australia because I came to see my two boys uh yeah that's it and half my classmates are in in Toronto in which some part of Canada is my classmates because in 83 I think half of them took off there and I have a whole lot of friends there yeah 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 wow that's so interesting and thanks for taking uh talking to us from a sunny Australia it's, but, it's it's not too sunny compared to Sri Lanka. I'm kind of not enjoying the autumn part or <laughs> not autumn. I think it's, yeah, it's coming into winter. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it, it it's very miserable here in Toronto at the moment, <laughs> too. It's super cool. Um, but you know what? Why don't we just jump into the questions? And, you know, one of the most frequently asked questions was, you know, how did Kosturi do it? And you know that's a really wide question, and I wanted to narrow it down and and maybe ask you what do you think made you stand out um, separately from your colleagues that got you to where you are today? Okay, so I think um, I come from a place that everyone is different, right? Um, <laughs> where you would manage your work and lead as a leader, and where I would would be different. So it comes from that standpoint point that each one of us is unique. But where I did my uniqueness kind of work favorably for me is that first did, I did say that I um, didn't have ambitions. I was never a career minded person, right? So I didn't have ambitions of a title and a career succeeding. I needed a job. I needed a salary to look after my kids. I was ambitious enough to want my kids to have a better better set of options than me. So, I mean, if they wanted to go overseas, they had the freedom or the, the capital to do that. So underlying that, um, it never was, a title never defined me. So you're out there in the world, just uh, trying to do things the best way you can. And title is a byproduct of it. Versus, um, of course, my colleagues who were running for it were men. 
And I think in that part of the world, you are always constricted with the definition of success being um, title, the car mm -hmm. you drive, amount of money you have, the house you have, and all sorts of labels going on with it. And I guess that's a lot of pressure. So you're really chasing behind a title versus I was just chasing this behind doing well in what I did. So that was the first difference. But I think the key point was when I, I, I finished 20 years in Hava. So that time when I became CEO, I was 17 plus years. Um, I did six roles. I have done five roles before that. So I was the only one in the group who was dumb enough or bold enough or passionate enough to take anything thrown my way. So from an accountant, I was a finance director. I moved into setting, setting up shared services, which is process. Then I actually ran the group IT, which is a CIO's role. I, I mean, that was the single biggest risky thing I did because I gave up what I was good at, which is finance. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was my bread and butter. I was venturing out in a place I didn't have any clue. I mean, whether it was hardware, or software or cloud or whatever, it, did, it looked like it sounded like great, but I knew what it, how businesses could benefit. And I took that role on so that I moved into that. I moved into different um, uh, businesses in terms of um, running it, logistics, my time. I took on, took on a CMD's role there. I took on farmers. So I was the only one in the leadership who went around. And at the end, I knew every business. So that would have been um, a single biggest um, uh, difference uh, other than being um, passionate about whatever I did, yeah. Wow, that's that's some amazing insight, actually. You, you need to do what you're doing well in order to get to where you are, basically. Um, yeah. rather than chasing the title, which which is an amazing, amazing piece of advice. Um, well, in the theme of today of International Women's Day, I wanted to ask, you've done, like you said, six positions there. You've had all these experiences in these different departments. I wanted to see if your gender had any sort of barrier for you that you had to overcome that you think maybe yeah. your male counterparts didn't really need to do, so... Um, I, well, I would say generally it didn't have a barrier in terms of how they viewed it as a capability. So that's how I was given those options because any individual with that set of skills they needed was given mm -hmm. the role. However, I think, um, in the context of, um, uh, log when I took over as a managing director of logistics, maritime and aviation, um, that maritime industry is a lot about playing golf, um, going out for drinks in the evening and giving, getting business across the bar or, a, or, a, or a, the round of drinks, I guess, and building relationships that way. So I struggled with that in the sense I struggled it in my, I struggled in my mind because how do I own it? I was a woman. I was not comfortable doing that because my kids um, were young. Uh, I was, I, I'm, I, I was not going to drink for the sake of drinking. And, uh, so, you know, I took the bull by the horns and I did have very honest conversations with the principals who came in, they would come in just for a couple of days. I'll take them out lunch, even early drinks and dinner. And then I stay around by 38. I said, look, apologies, but I need to go. But my team is there to take you around and do whatever and enjoy your time. And they became, they, and, and I would explain my kids are alone at home and, and you wouldn't believe how they understood it. So honestly, I think, that was a big change and fast tracks. I did that in 2010, 11. So now over 10 years, some of the young ladies in the maritime industry um, have started to pivot and they keep, you know, touching base with me to understand how do you have that conversation? Because they've got used to um, going out and being one of the boys to be, to feel you're fitting into it. So that was the only uh, challenge I felt because the challenge was within me because would I be okay being myself and how do I own it and succeed even in spite of it? So that was, I think, the single only thing I would say as a challenge I had, yeah. That's very interesting because, you know, one of the more common um, pain points, I guess, that women who are in leadership talk about is their ability to balance um, family as well as career and you know you're a mom and you're talking about how you were just open about it 
did you, I just want to know, were you always confident enough to do that? Or was it something that like through various experiences you thought, okay, this is the way to go? It's firstly, I think any human being doesn't get, doesn't balance anything. You make choices. And in every single day, there's a, there are, it's skewed towards one aspect of your life and uh, something is neglected, but you're happy with it. That content, it, the, fa the, the point of which you know what makes you happy or your content is wherever the balance would fit in. Um, so your question was, uh, was I always like that? Um, I think it's anchored around, so when till the age of about 29, I was like working part-time. When I got married at 22, I, I was like ready to give up any work I was doing at Somestron that was then it moved to Art Anderson, but not it from. And my partner was quite wise, and thank God he was. He said, just work part time. And I, I, that's how I had my kids and stuff. But once I pivoted to full time role and I became a single mom, I guess when you anchor it around your kids and that you know passionately that's the single most important thing in your life, mm -hmm. you kind of own that and you you don't apologize for that and so everything else you do it around it so I guess I was confident enough in my ability to on my work and I knew that I could when I put my mind to it I could really hit the ball out of the park if so to speak but um, only when I put my mind to it I half the time I kind of <laughs> I kind of mosey along but um, and I don't do that on my term so I learned it very early, I guess, when I had this conversation with, at, at Hey Mars, when I, in 2002, when I came in for the interview, they were like, yeah, but you need to commit long hours. And I remember this young 31-year-old girl or 30 or 31-year-old girl telling them, why should long hours be there? Something is wrong the way you do your job. You should be able to finish your job within the stipulated time. Otherwise, there's, you're inefficient in it. And I said, I'll make sure the job is done. Don't expect to stay all long hours unless, unless it's an emergency and I need to do it. Otherwise I won't. And there was a pin drop silence. And, um, and there was some other technical question, question which I pushed back. Again, there was silence, but there were two things. The first time I applied to the group, I didn't get a job. It was auto, as a finance director for a hotel sector because they for, found me too strong of a personality. Uh, but the CFO, who was a woman at that point, Serena Fonseca, my first boss, she loved it. She thought, look, I'm going to get her back in somehow into some other role. And she got me back in when there was a next vacancy. So, and I went in it, into it in my terms. So I kind of learned that people adjust. And I was lucky it was, I was blessed to be part of HEMAS because for them, I mean, today's, this time's Women's Day is about equity. It was equity then, 20 years ago. I would come into work, not only me, women who were, had kids, young moms would come into work after dropping their kids. I could go off at three o'clock to just do my kids' work, but I'll be back at six o'clock. They gave us a flexibility. There was no policy which governed me. Right. Today we have that as a policy. So yeah. Amazing. Um, that seems like a great culture to work for. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, you mentioned you're in Australia now, you're visiting um, your children. I was thinking about how um, people who grow in the ranks in Sri Lanka or even India sometimes think to come to the West to pursue, um, you know, jobs or, or, or whatever else. But so I'm curious if you ever thought about moving abroad or, and what kind of kept you in Sri Lanka? Honestly, zillion times, I think. Firstly, the first window I thought about it was when my when I got divorced and I had to look after two kids and I had this whole question in my head. I didn't own a house. I needed to figure that out. I had to figure out the kids' education fund and could I do that in Sri Lanka? Um, and being an accountant, Australia was, you know, in the early 2000s, you could easily migrate as an accountant. I had family here. Um, but I thought about it. At that time, honestly, my question was, in Sri Lanka, you have your domestics and I, 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 you have the help of somebody cooking for you versus how do I end up being in, my, in the kitchen, which I really am not a fan of. And I thought, no, I'm going to try and make you work here. But up, subsequently, I got jobs within a couple of years um, 
for global companies um, in finance. I got a couple of jobs. Um, uh, and at that point, what kept me back was my mom, uh, my parents, uh, especially my mom, because um, she went up, went uh, through a lot to educate all of to educate me. And, um, and uh, my father was a um, person who drank a lot of alcohol. So I, I just did, didn't want to leave her alone because my sister lived overseas. So, and once you make up your mind, there's no regrets. You stay on and make it work. So when I made up mind that I have to be there and my, I have to give back and make sure my mom is protected and looked after. And today she lives with me. Um, my dad passed on, but she has dementia. And I was lucky that I made, I was so blessed that I made that decision then because two years later or one year later, I figured out she had dementia, right? Today's 15 years down the line. She's okay. We, I have carers at home. Um, so there is no regret. So, and the testing point is about maybe three years ago or two years ago, I got this offer, amazing offer in global company in the West. And I mean, I would have worked one year and saved what I had to say for the whole life. But again, I look back and I thought, no, what's anchoring me is my mom here. So for the, for the moment, look, I've learned in my life to be happy with what you have. Don't want for more. God gives you what you have. And my kids are okay here in Aussie. What do I want? So, yeah. So there's no question. So it's it's this. I, I give a basic sanity check. If you can sleep at night mm -hmm. without regret, you put your head down and your conscience is clear, you're fine. You've made the right decision. Yeah. Amazing. And, and that's so commendable that, you know, you stayed for your mom and you helped her through all of that. Um, and you're continuing to help her through all of that. It's something that, you know, um, I think women, like we said, we can't balance everything, but we we do prioritize what we do prioritize yeah. and we make yeah. it work. So, you know, yeah. that's why I think women are amazing. Um, yeah. So moving on to another topic, I don't know if our viewers know this, but you're a very avid athlete and you won many <laughs> awards. So, you know, I thought it was very interesting and I wanted to see if you thought there are any transferable skills between an athlete and a CEO. I think that that was one of those uh, unique points um, which made it work for me as well, which I didn't mention. So what is an athlete to um, an athlete who succeeds or represents at a country, right? So I ended up playing for Sri Lanka basketball and netball. I captain basketball a year. But what does that treat you? Teach you? It teaches you that you need to repeat the same things over and over again to become excellent. You don't become excellent overnight. It teaches you that you it's a long hours of sacrifices. You wake up at five. You do this. You practice. You go to school or you go to work and you come back. You practice. Um, so you, it's a long day and you don't have the right to complain because that's life. Um, thirdly, it teaches you that uh, you need an ecosystem, a village to support you. You don't do it alone. There's no success alone. Um, technically, your parents are there, your colleagues are there, um, your, somebody to give you water, somebody to wake you up maybe. There is a support, your coaches are there. So you need to understand and appreciate a support system. There's no success without um, that. So that again is, all these are transferable to the corporate sector. But the most important thing, I think, and in a team sport, which I, I always tell on my team, if you say, um, take a cricket team, or I played basketball or netball, each of us have a role to play in the team. You can be a shooter, you can be a defense, you can be the center player, but each of us have a role and you have a skill you have to be excellent in. And it's up to us. It's no point in me being the best shooter if I don't encourage the, the, the center court player to be fitter. Or if, I, if, I, if I'm the best batsman, I don't encourage the bowler to be better and precise because it's up to us to make sure others are, are, best, are their best version of themselves for the team as a whole to succeed. The inverse of it is that the, the, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So if you want to, and the goal is not for you to shine and say you're man of the match, the goal is that we want the team to win. 
So that is really the most important thing in a corporate sector. We have different, we have one vision, one goal, but we have different departments which need together to do their own part at the right time and connect and support each other to win. It becomes so political. Each one is like, why is this department asking me this? What is this politics? So I kind of break all that and say, this is what it is. So I guess these things are really transferable to the corporate world. And no university or no MBA is going to teach you that. And in the real world, what's in the textbook is not practical. It may, it's practical in theory, but you need life experience, working with the ingredients, which are human beings, mm -hmm. understanding the ingredients and the uniqueness, which are again human beings and their skills. And how do you blend it together? That's another skill altogether. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I didn't realize that there were so many connections that could be transferable, but it makes absolute sense, you know, both places, you're a team. Um, so, you know, that kind of leads me to wonder, you know, you're a role model for a lot of people, but who do you look at as a role model, not just in a career aspect, but maybe even in a personal aspect? Is, is there someone that may have influenced how you think? Um, so one thing is, look, career-wise, since I was never a career, a person who aspired for a career, I didn't have this whole role model thing as long as I was growing up. Right. My mom was an amazing person I used to look, look at because she didn't complain. She did three jobs just to educate all of us. And anybody who came home was um, had food on the table. Uh, so I guess this resilience and strength of um, taking a family along um, as a rock was something I always admired about her. But more important, from an individual perspective, I admired Mother Teresa, not for anything. I don't know humanly how somebody can do what she did mm -hmm. and, and, and impact so many human beings. And that was something I, I'm, I just admire and still do. Um, and of late, up, I think role models on corporate, I didn't, but have anybody but I I kind of admire when I read the book of Indra Nuya I thought she was an amazing person how she what she had rocked how she rocked the world and uh, yeah that was maybe the person I would look at awesome I mean me too <laughs> so we have that in common what do you think would be three traits that a successful leader would possess three traits um I, I guess uh, oh, first one would be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so first the, the ability on a technical side, the ability to zoom out and zoom in, um, so, and, and be able to kind of tick the box or tick the, connect the dots in the process. Mm -hmm. And my son is just walking in and trying to help <laughs> 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 uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so ability to do that zoom out and zoom in is an important part of a leader's role. Um, the, the, the ability to, you know, it's not about leading. You don't need to lead a per team, but you should be able to um, get the team members to ignite what's unique about themselves, get the best out of them and shape them into the right places and the right right individuals at right places to, to deliver their objective is I think something we um, as leaders a great leader should have that ability to understand people and and uh, be able to put them in the right places um, the third one is I think the final one is that leader should be comfortable and authentic whichever the style it is you you just don't you can't be somebody you're not and if that works, it works. Yeah. Amazing. Curious, is this something that you also kind of, maybe you do you impart this wisdom on your employees as well? Does anyone really, like if someone is trying to be someone they're not, do you sit them down and tell them, hey, yeah. let's just be authentic here? So I don't prescribe anything, but I try to understand why they struggle in figuring out what they who they are in, in, as a leader and right. um, helping them to understand what their strengths are. So each of us bring one or two things to the table. We can't bring the whole gamut of stuff. And that, how do they own that space? 
and it, you know the best part of it is as a leader i i i'm not shy to say that i don't know million things and i get the people the best in those to work for me and i'm comfortable being the the dad in the room and saying okay explain what it is i don't know it yeah but i have the ability to pick it and then connect the dots at the at the overall sense yeah all right i mean that you're saying that is one of the most important traits to have so noted <laughs> um okay so i wanted to speak about a recent trend um post pandemic a lot of women in leadership have been stepping down um you know we already talked about balance and how balance is not something that we can really live up to but i think the pandemic had really allowed women to see oh my god like I have to do it all I have to be at my desk I have to make food for my kids and I have to take care of my elderly parents and do you do you see anything that we're not seeing as to why this happened what are your thoughts on this sort of trend yeah I I see that and especially I think some of the global leaders um have uh, had that uh, it's not only the burnout of it's not the trying to be everything to everyone and being there at the top of your game for every moment in your career or the family time i think it's another aspect as well i personally would feel it because um, it's about you you as as women we we very passionate right and um, there's a lot of empathy and a high level of um, uh, in tune with with people around and you feel um quite a bit more your feeling and and stuff is more amplified can you hear me yeah can you hear me sorry i just can't hear you though something happened oh you okay now yeah yeah, yeah. so okay so so i guess uh when you feel that passionate and you want to solve you're bringing your 110 and you absorb a lot of the emotion and energy you do it consistently for a year or two at that same pace there is emotional burnout versus i don't say men are not emotional but they don't take that to heart too much it's a job right and you look at it as a transaction i don't think women leaders can look at it as a transaction because it's kind of very absorbed into our dna in how we feel and the heart and head gets connected and and uh, you passionately get involved while uh, detaching and then can, in the next day again you want to solve it you you're passionate about it i guess that drain on emotion and the fact that you to go that battery that emotional battery needs recharging now for example i'm here in australia and once in 3 to 6 months i do a break because i know i i do feel bad not emotionally not not um, physically or not the work pressure pressure would always be there but because the way i'm geared i want to succeed i want i have the passion in me and every day you're solving problems that you know you need to be able to take a break and do this so i guess that's one another part of it it's just that like for example when jacinta arun um step down and i thought about it i thought i do understand i mean she was solving everybody's issues and it was taking and she was a mom and she she had was i don't think you have enough in your tank to solve your family problems and family's needs and 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 work needs at the same pace for over a longer period if you take breaks and there's a scene is a different scenario yes to this context yes okay and you know you you do speak about how as women we were more empathetic and were more passionate how did that kind of play a role in when you were maybe in a junior position and then now as a leader to people how does that play a role in that, in how you do or interact so at a junior position or even in school i was i <laughs> think i was known for a person who was uh, who stand up for i think every, anybody else's fight is my fight i don't <laughs> see i i can't see anything unfair going around in the world i want to stand up and solve it uh, it so happened the same was in at work and i wouldn't um, 
um, because I, I feel for the people and I see this unfairness and a disciple person doesn't really uh, stand up for him or herself. And I, I just do that. Um, and I, I did, it didn't, it didn't go well in many occasions because in a corporate world, they wonder what this is. So I had, and in my journey, I actually had a coach who helped me at every transition. And that was the investment the group did. He was an amazing coach from India. Um, and um, he actually told me one thing. He said, okay, you're passionate. It's against your value system. That's why you stand up for it. However, how you approach the situation, you need to do it calmly. If not, the outcome is not what you want. As an outcome, what people see is a passionate woman who is ranting away versus as an outcome that you won't change. So what I've learned over time is how do you moderate and keep your feelings and make sure you structure your thoughts when you communicate and leave the emotion out of it. So today as a leader, um, it helped me tremendously during the last two years. One is the COVID, but secondly, third is the, um, the financial crisis, which we're still going through. But I had to be honest to people and I had to understand where they came from. For, for example, you have COVID time, we found our nurses working 24 seven for days. They didn't see their family. So I would go down to the floor to understand really what are your problems at home? Because this is a problem I can't solve here, but can I take care of your family? So there were kids who were doing A-levels who needed transport. There were kids, families who need food. We kind of did all that, but they needed to help me. So I, as a woman, you understand that you, 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 because you feel for, for people, right? Um, I'm not saying men don't. There are plenty of amazing leaders who do. Uh, so for me, the empathy and passion helped it that way. So today in this context, um, it's easy for me to have a conversation with the team uh, to get the best out of them and to be honest enough to say, look, this is what is happening, but I know this is these are the impacts to you. For example, inflation impacts all of them but I can't solve it to the fullest extent. What I can solve is a certain amount, but that they have to solve my problem as making the company succeed. So I break it down. Each of your roles have to be, you have to deliver it so that our customer comes back or so that the product is the best in the market or it delivers its functionality so that there is repeat purchase so that we succeed. Then I solve you, solve this problem. So I guess um, it allows you to, be honest with that. But the other side of it is also how do you have tough conversations? So my style is I, I would have, I've sent a couple of people, with, which I see it's detrimental to the business. I would do weaning them out, but I would be very honest. I don't, uh, I would have the conversation myself and I'll be very honest and, and to the point, which I guess they appreciate it at some level. They might not like it, but um, at least you're honest enough with them. So, yeah. Amazing. Okay. So we need to wrap up this, uh, this session. We, I think the question that will kind of put everything together is what is a piece of advice that you would give a young woman who wants to become a leader in her field um, whether that is male dominated or any other field, but what is one critical piece of advice that you would give this woman? I guess um, who you end up being as a leader or where you end up is also as a person is part of your journey of life. So you need to own every moment and every, I keep telling my kids, if you have a crisis or you have a tough time, don't complain because that's giving you lessons how to come out of it. At, a, at the end of it, when you come out of it, you turn back and see, look, you're not the same person. You have learned certain life skills. You have learned certain decision-making processes. In that, don't lose yourself. So for any young leader, embrace the life's journey. Whatever direction or path it turns and goes, um, make it work for you. Um, it'll be tough. It'll be good times. There'll be tough times. But in the process, you're laddering up your personality. and own it well so I always literally say with my bronze skin I keep saying own your skin well wear it well and be proud of it so and the same goes for your leadership style so I have all my quirkiness around me but uh, that's who I am I don't apologize for it it's amazing that, that's an amazing note to end off on and this was a great 
uh, great chat. Thank you so much again for yeah, joining so us welcome. today. Um, thanks everyone for joining Tamil Innovators by TamilCulture.com.